This is a show that brings to the forefront newsmakers, entertainers, and those making a difference in our lives and in our world. Each week is a new adventure with topics ranging from the most serious and cutting edge to the most lighthearted and entertaining. This is Taking Care of Business with Richard Solomon. Greetings, everyone. Richard Solomon, Taking Care of Business. We are continuing our coverage on WCWP 88.1 FM to provide all the tools to our listeners and our local community for the coronavirus epidemic response. Today, we're going to be talking to a very highly qualified group of professionals on tax and financial matters. So we have a former guest of the show and a great friend of the show and an incredible tax attorney. It's Karen Tenenbaum from Melville, Long Island. Thank you, Karen, for being with us. And, Thanks for having me. And, and just so you know, um, there's a red phone in my office. And when people come in and they tell me some kind of horror story and the word tax comes up, I pick up the phone and I, I just call Karen's office because these people really have the answers. They're phenomenal and they teach a lot uh, all over the place. They're, uh, I, I've been to their courses on, at CW Post over the years. I've been to their courses with the different bar associations. Uh, you really get the best legal tax advice anywhere from her firm. Also, Thank you. We always, say, we always say that we're here as a resource and we're here to help. All right. And people really need help. So I'm glad everybody's out there listening because this is going to be a great resource today. I also have two certified public accountants on the line. We have Alexandra Starr, who goes by Lexi, and we have, we have Elliot Levenhart. So, uh, and they're with the firm KVLSM. CPAs, and you can find them at kvlsmcpa.com. And of course, Karen is litaxattorney.com. All right, to start off, Karen, you have like a top 10 list. I guess I feel like David Letterman. Do you have a top, <laughs> top, because he's retired, so I guess I'll pick up the mantle. Do you have a top 10 list on the, uh, of the, but the federal stuff that's going on right so, now? So obviously, the law is changing on a regular basis, but we put together the top 10 list. And if anyone wants a copy, they could email me at tax helpline at litaxattorney.com. Uh, what's funny is that we normally say the IRS and New York State are very aggressive and very assertive, and they're coming after you. And in New York State, they, they come with the, New York, with the, uh, the, the dreaded C's sign. They take your restaurant they, or your retail store, and they put that orange sign that they're locking it up because you didn't uh, pay your taxes. Uh, or they take away your driver's license. Or they take money out of your bank account. Or they're taking money out of your wages. Or they're taking away your passport at the IRS level uh, if you owe more than $53,000. And so in addition to the top 10 list of what you need to know now, we also have what we call the cheat sheet, which is really everything that's in the IRS and New York State's toolbox for collection and all the things that you can do uh, as an alternative. So again, if you want to get a copy of any of those, you could write to me either at taxhelpline at litaxattorney.com or K. Tenenbaum, that's T-E-N-E-N-B-A-U-M at litaxattorney.com. But right now, what you need to know is that the IRS has provided some temporary relief, New York State a little bit, but not as much relief and guidance. And so I think it's important to, uh, to get into some of those details now. Let's do it. And as I mentioned... As I mentioned, this law is changing on a daily, daily basis, um, but the top 10 list, we, we change uh, daily as well. <laughs> so you'll get the most up-to-date if you write to me. Right. So let's talk about some additional time uh, for filing and for payments. And I'm going to start, but I'm going to let uh, the accountants jump in whenever they think it's appropriate. So uh, many have heard already that the deadlines to file a federal return and make payment that was due April 15th, 2020, has been extended to July 15th, 2020, and no penalties or interest will accrue. Your estimated taxes for your first and second quarters for the federal level have both been extended to July 15th, but both quarters must be paid by July 15th or interest and penalties will begin to accrue. And if you uh, want to cl uh, make a claim for refund for the 2016 year, it's normally a three-year statute of limitations, and you need to have filed uh, by April 15th. You now have until July 15th, 2020. I'm going to uh, let the, the accountants, if they want, chat about the withholding tax and employee ret uh, retention credit. Um, so I'll take that, Karen. This is Lexi. Um, so there's some relief um, regarding the employer taxes. Um, 
for the pandemic, and one of them is um, withholding tax. They're um, expanding federal relief to businesses and allowing them to defer the employer's portion of the Social Security tax. That's 6.2% for all of 2020. Um, They are deferred but must be repaid in two installments. The first is going to be due December 31st, 2021. Second is due December 31st, 2022. Um, That is for Social Security tax only, not Medicare taxes. Um, And if you've received any of the PPP loan money, um, which we'll talk about later, you can only defer those taxes up until the forgiveness date of that loan. The other option that's out there is called an employee retention credit, and you can claim that credit. It's a refundable tax credit equal to 50% of up to $10,000 in qualified wages. Um, That's for wages paid after March 12th and before January 1st of 2021. Um, And um, so they're capped at $5,000 per employee, and it's a credit against um, employment taxes. And you have the choice of one or the other? Tell us about that piece. It's also uh, a fundable credit if not used for all employee tax. So correct. It, c- correct. If you haven't received a PPP loan, the employee retention credit is a great option, a great alternative option. Um, you cannot use the employee retention credit if you've received a PPP loan, but you can defer the withholding taxes up until the forgiveness date of the PPP loan. Could you great. just clarify that about uh, just again about... The retention credit, because that's, I think, something that is really not mentioned in the mainstream media much. Yeah, it's not mentioned much because the PPP loan was getting so much um, attention, publicity. publicity. And yeah, and um, so everybody was going for that. And if you get the PPP loan, you're not eligible for this employee retention credit. However, because some people gave up on applying or perhaps haven't been funded yet, this is a really good alternative option. Um, because depending on what your wage level is, it might actually end up being slightly better for somebody. But we never had the time to do the valuation and research regarding this because everybody had to, because the funds were not adequate. Everybody jumped on the PPP to get some immediate gratification. Again, just for people listening, the PPP is the... What what is it and how does that work? Because we might as well define well, gonna, that. Why don't we get into that deep detail later? But, why don't we focus now on uh, the federal okay. changes? All right. Well, okay. well, so anyway, for your listening, we'll get back to, wait, we'll get back to that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, paycheck paycheck. Okay. So let's also talk about other time sensitive transactions. I mean, some people are doing ten thirty one exchanges, um, and the um, transaction had to be completed around uh, this time. So now there's an extension. Uh, so any uh, transaction which by law had to be completed on or after April 1st and before July 15th is now considered timely if it's completed by July 15th. Also, if you're filing with the U.S. Uh, tax court, the petition deadline has now been extended. But let's talk about the collection action because that seems to be significant. Um, there Again, the IRS is temporarily postponing certain things, including certain collection action, uh, with ex- uh, respect to existing installment agreements, they are temporarily suspended. The payments are temporarily suspended until July 15, 2020. However, interest will continue to accrue. So if you have a current um, direct debit installment agreement, that will not automatically be suspended. The IRS will continue to take the money out of your bank account, so you really need to contact that bank to tell them to stop the automatic payments, but then call them back again to tell them to the resume the payments by July 15th. And if you have a current installment agreement, then not, it's not going to be defaulted during this period of time. This might be a good time to try to establish a new installment agreement, and you could actually try to do that online if you're under certain amounts. Uh, there's an online link uh, in the, uh, on an IRS page, and in fact, we have a free app. You could download our tax helpline app, and we have links to the IRS and New York State web pages that are going to be relevant here. So the IRS People First Initiative also offers a break with respect to offers and compromise. So if you have a pending offer and compromise, meaning you, you, you so an installment agreement meant you could pay, but you're going to pay over time. An offer and compromise means you're never going to be able to pay that full amount and you want something less. You want to pay something less. And so the, the deadline for uh, where they request additional information has been extended through July 15th, and they're not going to close any pending offer without the taxpayer's consent 
by, by that date. And if you have an accepted offer and the current payment is due, it's suspended until July 15th as well. However, interest will continue to accrue. Now, you also must file um, your 2018 tax return by July 15th, probably your 2019 tax return by that date as well, and the estimated tax payments in order to be uh, compliant and current. Again, now would be a great opportunity to get your documents together and uh, try for an offer and compromise and to see if you qualify. There is, um, uh, again, something on the IRS webpage that tells you whether you qualify, and we have our link in the, in the app as well. I have a question. I have a Let's, question. Have sure. A quick question. You, you mentioned estimated taxes. Now, there's, the estimated tax payments are quarterly, and there's one in April, there's one in July, there's one in September, and there's one in January. If, there was if, one in June. Sorry, June. June. Okay, okay, so June. Yeah, June. All right. There would have been one in June. Both on the, so on the federal level, the, the first one and the second one are definitely deferred until July 15th. On the state level, definitely the second one. <laughs> I'm sorry, definitely the first one, but it's not clear about the second one due on June 15th. I think um, everyone is saying that it's been delayed and deferred and suspended, but I haven't seen anything authoritative on that. All right, so, so we'll get to that when we talk about so the I, So I have a question. So let's say... Even it, Governor Cuomo said it's extended to July 15th, but there's nothing on the website. But I don't think he has the authority. Like, he didn't have the authority initially to even say the deadline was, was uh, deferred, and uh, it, it took an executive order uh, to do that. Right, so, we, so let's say you're a taxpayer... And your second estimated tax payment, you don't really have the funds for that because you're, you're you know, your business, whatever, your restaurant, you're this, that, you're closed, you've been forced to close, you're, you're a haircutter, you're a dentist, you're a whatever, uh, name all the businesses that are closed, you're an entertainment facility, um, you know, you're a small store, um, you know, that's crowded, like, I don't know, like an electronic store. What do you do when you don't really have the revenue to support the estimated tax payment and the tax payment would actually be a burden to pay? Uh, I, so exactly. With so many businesses closed, people will be experiencing financial hardship and won't be able to pay even with a deferral till July 15th. So we know that we're going to have a surge of business. Uh, in the, you know, We handle IRS and New York State tax problems, and we know that people are going to continually have problems because, uh, because they're not earning any income. Right. So what is the strategy that you, you, do you pay some estimated tax? Do you make an effort to pay some tax? Do you have to reach out to the IRS? Do you have to hire an attorney? Well, I guess your financial circumstances have changed. I guess the question is, uh, and Elliot could probably, and Lexi could probably explain this better re- with respect to being penalty proof and, and calculating those estimated taxes. Right. Estimated taxes, usually if you see a downfall in your business, you should really speak to your accountant and estimated taxes can be revised um, to avoid penalties, and nobody knows for sure if there are going to be penalties this year. Uh, you have to pay in 100% of last year, or sometimes 110% of last year, or 90% of this year. So normally what we do as CPA firms, we speak to the client and say, okay, you know, do you expect to earn the same amount of money as last year. Most clients will say yes, because it's um, estimated taxes are based on self-employment income or dividends and or interest or social security and pension withdrawals. So people have a pretty good idea, but everything is tossed out the window um, this year, so we can certainly revise the estimated tax payments to more fit what's going on in the world. Right, because I, I can see someone, let's say, a hairstylist right now. I mean, I don't know anybody what they're going to be able to do as far as reopening, at least for the moment, because, you know, you don't get more, you know, in personal contact than something like that where, you know, or, or, or dentists or, or nail places. I mean, I could see there's so many businesses that I mean, are going to have a hard time opening. And, and yesterday yeah. who said I made for the four months, $60,000. I don't know. If I'm going to make another dime the rest of the balance of the year, and I may spend the $60,000 to um, keep my business afloat, what do I do with the estimates? I said, well, then we're going to obviously revise them down to zero at this point and call, call, call me when your business is reopened or after it's reopened and 
uh, we will take another look at it. I, one, one other question while we were sort of in this, uh, this segment, which only has a couple more minutes left. Um, if you get the PPP money, is that taxable as income? Yeah, again, I think we should save all the PPP questions to the segment okay. where we all right, solely but- focus on that. Let's just quickly talk about the field collection activities with the IRS. So they're temporarily suspending new audits. Uh, ongoing audits are continuing remotely, but there are no in-person meetings. They're suspending new liens, new levies. Passport certification has been suspended where they call you seriously delinquent and take away your passport. They're going to stop temporarily seizures of the personal residence, uh, referrals to private collection agencies. However, if you're a high-income non-filer, they're still going to pursue you, and they're going to take similar activities where warranted to protect themselves uh, with the statute of limitations. And so it's really um, a good time to... uh, Hold on to your cash. Take a break. They're not coming after you. However, if you do have an ongoing wage garnishment or an ongoing uh, levy, they are those are going to continue. All right now, obviously, this is the best time to consult professionals. Uh, you know, during the lull, especially because everybody's not really running around in court or, or at you know at the government in their offices. People are probably more accessible. So during the lull. If you do have questions, really do reach out to various professionals out there. By the way, well, now's a great time because they issued a memo through the IRS saying to be sensitive to the individual circumstances and provide appropriate relief. So it might be a great time to settle an old matter or tell them my financial circumstances have changed and renegotiate an installment agreement, et cetera. Right now, it's I, also a very good time just to get all your books and records up to date so that, that these estimates can be adjusted and projections can be made based on what's happened so far. Right, and everybody has time now to kind of make get all their files in order, where they may have been a little bit. You know, life life is always hectic, and people always have the time for filing. You know, physical filing, organization, and this and that. But now, I think we do. All right, this is Richard Solomon. We have like a minute left in this segment. Again, this is gonna we're gonna try to get this uh, radio show certified as a CLE with the Nassau County Bar Association. For those who are listening, uh, for the general public out there, this is a great resource. Please stay with us. Again, we have phenomenal experts with us. We have uh, our very good friend, Karen Tenenbaum. We have uh, Lexi Starr, and we have Elliot Lebenhardt. And uh, Lebenhardt. And we'll be right back. Uh, don't go away. And by all means, if you have questions, email them to us. We'll forward it to them. And on our YouTube site, we'll put all the contact information so that if you uh, miss it here on FM, or on the streamcast, you'll get it on YouTube, and we'll make sure all this information is out there for you. Stay tuned. Hi, this is the Great Sordini. You're listening to Richard Solomon on 88.1 FM WCWP. Okay, everyone, Richard Solomon, welcome back. Uh, we are continuing our COVID-19 information response through WCWP, 88.1 FM. And we have a phenomenal panel here. Uh, Hopefully this will be certified by the Nassau County Bar Association for a continuing legal education credit. And on the line is Karen Tenenbaum, tax attorney. She has an LLM. She's a CPA herself. She's really an overachiever. And, and, but, but that's what you want. The, the professionals you hire, you, you, you know, you don't really want the person that got like the lowest grades and just squeaked by, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know, you know, there's a joke in law school. It's like, what do you call, you know, the, the, the person who graduated law school with a D average attorney. So, <laughs> all right. And then we have Elliot Lebenhart and Lexi Starr and they are CPAs and they are with KVLSM LLP, uh, KV, VLSMCPA.com. And Karen, of course, is LITaxAttorney.com. And they have great websites, especially Karen's got all kinds of useful stuff and apps. All right. So now this segment, we're going to talk about the state, New York State. Let's talk about how New York State has some similar and different things regarding taxes and collections and all the other things and audits and whatever. And more importantly, maybe we should start with this, residency. Karen's kind of an expert in residency. (laughs) And when they told all these people to shelter in place, they may have actually not been in New York at the time, and they may be cooling their heels in other places. How does that affect their taxes? 
Yeah, so that's, those are great questions. I can't even tell you the answers, but I can tell you the issues clearly that are raised. So we're always talking about where would you be taxed? So New York State says we're taxing you as a resident. I, I hear an echo. Yeah. You hear an echo? We're taxing you as a resident on all your tax, no matter where you earned it. Um, if you're domiciled here or if you're um, taxed as a resident, which means you have a permanent place of abode and you spend more than 183 days in New York. And so if you have a place here that, that you can shelter in <laughs> um, and, you, and the day count is over 183 days, you're taxed as a resident on all of your income. And so this could be a major issue. First of all, where are you sheltering? quote, at home. You know, were you in Florida? A lot of, we hit, represent a lot of snowbirds. So were you in Florida October through May and stuck there? Um, were you here either on a business trip or uh, visiting family and now you're stuck here? And if you're prevented from traveling, uh, is this additional time in the state going to hurt you? So I think these are going to be very interesting issues with respect to day count. Now, I know that if you're, let's say, in a um, in a hospital, an inpatient in a hospital, there are clear rules that you're really here involuntarily, and those days don't count against you. Will there be similar rules with respect to this? We're only going to know in hindsight. And so what's going to happen is the, uh, New York State, when they audit you, then they audit you know, deep pockets, and, and uh, uh, I think they do 3000 a year, something like that. Um, when they finally audit you, they're going to do it for three years. And so they're going to have the benefit of hindsight. So it's not just what you did in this one year. What did you do for the three years? And so if you're claiming that you changed your domicile or you're claiming that you weren't here, first of all, the taxpayer usually has the burden of proof. So if you were always a New Yorker and you're claiming to move out, you have the, the taxpayer has the burden of proof. If you were always out and now New York State's trying to claim that you're here, they would have the burden of proof. So that'll be an interesting issue to see what goes on. There are also certain exceptions when you deal with um, spending time out of the country, 450 days out of 548 days in a foreign country and only 90 days in New York. What's going to happen when they said you can't, you can't travel anymore or everyone who was away you know, in a foreign country had to come back? There's also a convenience versus necessity test, which they look at when you work from home. So are you working from home for, because it's a necessity for the employer or your convenience. And so all of these things are going to come up, uh, and it's going to be quite interesting to see how New York State reacts. One thing I can tell you is that New York State has not provided as much guidance um, as the IRS. So New York State has provided extended due dates for certain things, which we could get into. They've offered relief from certain penalties with respect to sales tax and other things. And they've allowed electronic signatures on certain documents until May 9th, 2020. I don't know the significance of that. However... What happens when you have an existing bill? If you have an installment payment agreement or hey, an income hey, hey, Karen, can I yes. jump in yes. just for a quick second and ask you an important question? Sure. Let me, just finish, let me just finish that one. All right, go ahead. Go ahead. We'll, we'll get back to that. The question is regarding a non-resident of New York. In other words, let's say an individual lives in New Jersey and works in New York, but now he's been sheltered in place and is working out of his home in New Jersey. Can we allocate the days out of New York and have them pay taxes to the resident state as opposed to the non-resident state? That's been a big issue for many people who live in Connecticut and live in New Jersey who could come into New York City to work. Right, and that's exactly the convenience versus necessity test question. So, right. yeah, go ahead. No, so, no. In the, yeah, yeah. So, um, in the past, if you were... Uh, always a New York employee working in New York, and now you worked at home, that would still count as a New York day. Now the question is, what's going to happen under these circumstances? Right. Yeah. All right, so let's talk, about, let's talk about the release. Wait, 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 uh, that, Karen, Karen, before yeah, you... Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah. Should people keep diaries of where they were so that if they oh, need to... Yeah, okay. Right, of course. Um, you're going to have the burden of... The taxpayer is going to definitely have the burden of proof uh, by clear and convincing evidence of where they spent their time. Um, there are a lot of apps that keep track of you traveling. Uh, there's Tax Day, Tax Bird, Maneo. I even think uh, Google Maps keeps track of it. That You usually have to, um, I always say it's uh, like a colonoscopy. They look up your rear end with a microscope. <laughs> um, 
right? And you have, you have to show them your credit card bills. And when you're normally going to the office, they could even uh, subpoena your swipe cards. Uh, they're looking at your cell phone bills. Um, but obviously, if you're sit- sitting in your house and you're not going anywhere, um, how do you prove where you are? If you're using a landline, then, you know, you can look at those records. Uh, but the taxpayer is going to have the burden of proof in, in respect to the day count. Well, you know what you can always do? You can always hit one of those, like, speed cameras and get a couple of tickets here and there and <laughs> just to show that. <laughs> just to yeah, show no, one's that. Out, no one's out even getting gas anywhere, right? Um, so let's just talk quickly about the, uh, the filing and payment uh, deadlines. So New York State, originally at a press conference, Governor Cuomo said, oh, we're following the federal and the, date, the deadlines are extended. But he actually didn't have, uh, you, you need to have an executive order uh, before you could do that, um, which was eventually signed. And now the, the deadline for filing and payment for the individual corporate return, a few others, uh, is extended from April 15th to July 15th, 2020. Payments deferred um, could be any amount and no penalties and interest will be assessed. With respect to the estimated tax payments I mentioned earlier, uh, certainly the first one is uh, delay is deferred till July 15th, but it's not 100% clear about the June 15th second quarter estimate. Um, we'll, we'll see. There's nothing, uh, no specific guidance on the New York State website or anywhere that I have seen exactly, although I think Cuomo said it himself that it is extended, but let's see what happens. Um, withholding tax forms and payments must still be filed and uh, paid on time. Now, let's talk about sales and use tax. You mentioned all these restaurants and all these businesses that, that are closed. Um, if you were unable to meet your quarterly sales tax filing and or payment requirements that were originally due on March 20th, you may have your deadlines extended by 60 days and have interest and, and penalties abated um, if you meet certain requirements. But it's all actually determined on a case-by-case basis. So, uh, the relief is granted if the returns are filed and paid within that 60-day period. The relief would not apply to a part quarterly, you know, a monthly filer or a prompt tax filer. And they have a link on the New York State website uh, where you could uh, apply for the relief or you could wait for a penalty notice and uh, file a request after that. With respect to collections, New York State did not say like the IRS when we're suspending new everything and, 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 and stopping everything. Um, they, they originally said something that didn't relate to taxes. They said, oh, we're temporarily suspending collection on student loans and medical debt, but they never said anything about tax debt. So if you have a wage garnishment, um, it's not automatically suspended. You know, you know, an income execution, if you have an installment payment agreement, it's not automatically done. Um, if you're a non-filer, now would be a great time to do a voluntary disclosure. If you want an installment agreement and you owe 20000 or less, you could go online and get an installment payment agreement for 36 months. If you want to do an offer and compromise, they just started something in October before all of this where you could request a, an offer and compromise online for if you owe 10000 or less. I believe it only applies to individuals. Of course, you could always call New York State. They are answering the phones, whereas the IRS is not as easily accessible, and ask for a hold on collection, and we've been seeing that they've been giving 60 days as a hold. So that's, you know, that's good news. Anybody else want to jump in with uh, anything relating to New York State? Now, as I mentioned no. earlier, New York State is allowing electronic signatures on certain documents through May 9th. Right, let, me, let me ask a couple of questions because you, you raised a couple of really interesting points. When you mentioned the word non-filer, um, that, that's someone who's not filed their tax returns. So this is a great provision. This has always been around. So you could um, have not filed for many, many, many years, and the non-filer uh, voluntary disclosure program allows you to go online. We're definitely having a reverberation now. Maybe you should try to talk a little slower or maybe move your phone. We'll have you call sure. in on the next segment, you know. Sure. Yeah. So um, is this better? I think this is better. Yeah. So um, you could get... Um, they, they have a three to six year look back period. They don't apply penalties. There's no penalty abatement necessary because it's already abated and they don't refer it for criminal. So this is really, so even if, so whether you're um, a non-filer for any purpose, any type of tax, this applies. As long as you get to them before they get to you. <laughs> exactly. If they've already started an audit uh, or coming after you for some other reason, then you're in trouble. So when they mean voluntary disclosure, they mean voluntary, not... <laughs> not oh, because we've gone to them before they've gone to us. 
I, so, so well, well, I'll tell you, if they come after you for one period, you could do a, a voluntary disclosure for another period. We actually had a, a very nice uh, case. We, we got a great result for a client. He brought in a lot of artwork from a foreign country and uh, declared it at customs, and they, they came after him for use tax. And then we were able to say, do you have this problem in later years? And he did, and we filed for a voluntary disclosure, and he saved a lot of money uh-huh. in the penalties. I, the, real fast, if there, if you're a member of the Nassau County Bar Association, and if big if this course is approved, the code will be KJT five six two zero KJT five six two zero. One more time, KJT five six two zero. We'll try to repeat that one more time at the uh, at the end of, in the third segment. So I would say that if you have any kind of collection activity being taken right now, whether it's with the IRS or New York State. Now is really a good time to try and change the terms, if you, if, if necessary, under your financial circumstances. Yeah. So let, let's talk a little bit about tax planning. Given all of this, it's obvious that incomes are going to be much different for a lot of people. Let's look forward to next year, the twenty twenty one. What should people be thinking on a federal and state level now about next year? and how they should be formatting their files or talking to you professionals like yourselves for next year? Because this is all going to reverberate right into next year and maybe even the year after that. I'm going to let you guys jump in over there. Yeah. Uh, Lex, you want to go first or you want me? No, go ahead. Okay. We usually look at tax planning at two years at a time. So we would look at 20 and 21. If 20 is a poor year income wise, and we wanted to keep you at a lower tax bracket, we may say to you, let's take some more income if you can in 2020 and not take it in 21. In other words, for argument's sake, we want to keep somebody at a 15% tax bracket and they don't have enough money to exceed the 15% bracket, we may take, we may tell them to take some additional money this year. Um, It's also, when you talk about tax planning, it's important to note that retirement distributions do not have to be taken this year. Um, If you took it, you have 60 days to put it back. If it's more than 60 days, you're out of luck. But this year is a year that you do not have to take um, retirement distributions and you do not have to double up in the future years. Just out of curiosity, why was that rule effectuated? So people can see what the market is so far down that people who don't need the money don't want to do, do not want to take it out. Okay, so in other words, this is to prevent realized losses. Well, they don't realize losses in a retirement account, right? Oh, they I see. they yeah. just will take out less money in a retirement account and deplete the asset. Uh, the theory is before it has time to go back up. Got it. Any other? That that's a good point. Is are, are there any other tax planning theories, ideas, or strategies that people should sort of have on their radar? What? No, I mean, I think it's a really good opportunity, like Elliot said, to kind of strategize on um, allocating income from one year to another if necessary. Um, but it, it's also a little preliminary as we really don't know, you know, where things are going quite yet. So it's a little difficult, I think, at this point in the year. But as it goes on, I think it'll unfold a little bit more. Which is another reason why you should keep in touch with your accountant to let him know let him or her, sorry, Lexi, know how you're uh, doing this year. Real fast, in the last minute and a half that we have in this segment for the accountants, what are the questions you're getting from your clients right now? What are they asking? About Firstly, tax. PPP-related questions is a lot of what we're getting. Right, but we'll, we'll do that in the next we're one. getting a lot of stimulus questions. Yeah. And... It seems like all the clients are blaming us for the fact that the unemployment insurance website is not working properly. <laughs> <laughs> well, Elliot, get, get your screwdriver. Get out there. <laughs> really? 
Really? So <laughs> other than PPP, it's been stimulus type questions and unemployment type questions. And unfortunately, you know, um, end of life um, questions. I've had, a, unfortunately, a whole bunch of those um, this week. And I'm going to briefly mention something that is not very well known. There's a Section 139 out there. Okay, everyone's saying, okay, so what is he talking about? Um, it allows an employer to provide serve, uh, money to an employee or an employee's family, i.e. funeral costs um, for somebody, for, a long, for an employee who passes away. Um, it is deductible to the employer and non-taxable to the recipient. Oh, that, that's interesting. That's good to know. Yeah, and that can be used for other things also, not just funeral costs, but other, other things as well. All of right. course. All right, so this is Richard Solomon. Going to uh, take a quick break. Uh, we'll be back with Karen, Lexi, and Elliot right after this. Hey, this is Jeff Matson, the Dark Star Orchestra, and you're listening to Richard Solomon on WCWP 88.1 FM. Welcome back. Richard Solomon, Taking Care of Business, 88.1 FM. So, Karen, we're in the world of radio, uh, and I understand you have a jingle. So I, 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 I am known being the person who uh, debuts lots of music and jingles, especially for my father's place, myfathersplace.com. Do you have a jingle you'd like to share with us? Yeah, thanks for letting me <laughs> debut it here. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to play it right now. So if anyone needs us, here's, here's our phone number. Uh, uh, tax attorneys. 631-465-5000. It, it had a very Disney-like ending. <laughs> <laughs> so we're here, as I said, we're here as a resource. We're here to help. Feel free to call us, 631-465-5000, and we're at litaxattorney.com. All right, so one, one really important question. If the next time you remaster the uh, jingle and you need some extra people in the chorus, can sort of like me and... Uh, Lexi and, and Elliot kind of be in the background. I, I, I could be go. I could be a baritone or a tenor. I don't know. You know. You know. <laughs> Are you funny? You know. All right. So let's talk about PPP uh, because that's on everybody's question list. First of all, what is PP? What does it stand for? Is it income? Um, you want me to start, Elliot? I can oh, take that you. one. It's batting first. <laughs> Okay. Well, PPP is the Paycheck Protection Program. It's gotten a lot of um, publicity for lots of reasons. Um, the money is not taxable uh, that you receive. It's either going to be forgiven based on a very co complex calculation that we'll give you a little background on, or it will be converted into a loan. And what came out recently is in addition to that, not only is the income not taxable, but the expenses you pay with that money are currently not deductible. So there is going to be no P&L effect, meaning it will not affect your bottom line, good or bad. However, they are making an appeal. Um, Congress is making an appeal to make those expenses deductible, which would be far more beneficial to the employers. So we're hoping that does come down the pike. But as of today, at this moment, the expenses are not deductible and the income is not includable. That's that's sort of antithetical. So that's interesting to know that that's not really been reported that you can't deduct um, expenses that I've never really heard before just until now. Yeah. Things are, well, things are evolving yeah. every minute and uh, things come out, you know, every single day and they haven't had time to kind of really publicize that too much, nor is it something people really want to hear. <laughs> okay. Okay. Keep going. Keep going. So, you, so we have the, 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 so how do you apply for it? Oh, it hasn't been publicized much is okay. that when you signed off on the PPP loan, you made a certificate certification in good faith, taking into account current business activity and their ability to access other sources of liquidity. That's sufficient to, support ongoing operations in a matter that is not detrimental to the business. 
That has caused a whole bunch of angst and concern for people who own businesses. I've gotten two or three phone calls today alone um, about that, saying, hey, I have a million dollars in the checkbook business account. My payroll is $100,000 a week. Do I need to... Get a P- Do I need to give back my half million dollars that I got in PPP? Sometimes it's a moral decision. You know, if I have a store that's not open, then probably not. If I'm an internet business and sales really aren't affected, then then maybe. But there's been s- such controversy to this that they just extended the give back portion or if you want to give the money back from May 7th to May 14th. That came out, I think, um, last night. Yeah. All right. Uh, Do you want to talk about furloughed employees? Well, why don't we go back to that for a second, because that all came out because of the very highly publicized public companies getting enormous amounts of funding and the little guys not getting the funding. So they came out and addressed that with this. um, They are putting out these... um, Frequently asked questions for us to, you know, updating all the um, unclear items. And this was the one that was addressed about economic uncertainty and has created a lot more havoc now for um, everybody else as to what the interpretation of that is. It, it, it started out where on the, the Small Business Administration issued the rules regarding the PPP program. They called it, which unbelievable. Interim final rules. So rather than changing the rules, they're giving FAQs, frequently asked questions, and they are defining things that way. I think they're already up to 42 um, FAQs. So FAQ 31 was about the large businesses. Then it came, I think, last Thursday night where they said, what about small businesses? And the answer was, she answer for, for number 31, meaning that the small businesses have the same responsibility of the large businesses. They've also said that they will audit everybody who took more than $2 million in PPP money. Okay, now, I, I, I guess that's a significant amount of uh, corporations out there uh, and stuff like that. To the average small business owner, how does the PPP work, whether you're a manufacturer, whether you're a retailer? Could you walk just th- through the process? I, I, it's like you have to go through your lender and all this other We're stuff. We're going to walk you through the process as if you're a not, if you're not a sole proprietor. Okay. Because that is different. Okay. So let's say you're like a, I don't know, a hair salon or a restaurant. No, no, but, but a hair salon or a restaurant that is a corporation right. or a partnership yeah, yeah. is different than a hair salon that is individually owned. Correct. The sole proprietorship. All right, so that's that's important to note. Uh, but do you want to start with the right. formula? So what happened was um, you you applied for your, this PPP loan through your bank and um, supplied them the information, and it was approved by the SBA, and the SBA has now funded a lot of people's loans. So now they have to utilize uh, loans, these funds, potentially forgiven. Um, so now people have to strategize on how to utilize this as to maximize the maximum amount of forgiveness. And, of course, there's a lot of hoops to jump through and a lot of calculations that need to be met um, and thresholds that have to be met so that there is forgiveness. So um, there's a couple of different things that have to be um, done in order to obtain maximum forgiveness. One of them is that you have to use 75% of your funds for payroll costs. Um, It's kind of an issue when you're closed and your people are home, um, but the spirit of this funding was really to get people off of unemployment and get your people um, whole and ready to go back to work as soon as the switch was flipped to open up businesses again. So that's becoming a bit of an issue because some people don't want to come off of unemployment. So they actually just came out with another FAQ regarding that, 
which is that if, um, you know, people are not going to come off of unemployment, you need to notify them that they have their job available and they have to notify in writing and they have to notify you back in writing that they are declining and they could potentially put their unemployment benefits at risk. And um, if they're furloughed, they could also be at risk of losing their benefits. Um, if that's the case, then they're, they don't go against your um, PPP forgiveness calculation. But they, you do need to utilize 75% of your money for payroll costs. You also have to keep um, your head count as far as the amount of employees um, equal with a look back period. So you can't um, cut people. You need to keep the same amount of employees and you can't cut one, one person's individual salary more than 75% either. Um, and Wait, the remainder of that. It, you can't cut it more than 25%, I thought. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, you can't yes, more than right. Correct. You you can't cut it more than twenty five percent. You have to pay them seventy five percent of their wages. Correct. Exactly. Um, During one of two time frames, right? And and what is the date of the of the employee count, Lex? The employee count. There's two different look back periods you can utilize. It's February fifteenth, two thousand nineteen, to June thirtieth, two thousand nineteen, or January first, twenty twenty, to February twenty ninth, twenty twenty. And all this matters on June 30th, 2020. This all right. matters when you go for forgiveness of loans. So depending on when you're funded, it depends on your eight weeks. You have up until June 30th to get your head count back up, your full-time equivalent count. Right. So if you got your money early and your eight weeks is up before, you still have to have your head count on June 30th. You That's spend right. your money during the eight weeks, but on June 30th, they Correct. look at the, the head count. Yes. Correct. So what what are the, the 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 traps of all of this? So it's sort of interesting. So I think the, the key is really what is what is to be forgiven. So you have to have spent a maximum a minimum of seventy five percent on your payroll and a maximum of twenty five percent on rent, utilities, et cetera. And so you have to do a calculation up front and anyone who earned more than a hundred thousand dollars, you you stop at a hundred. Plus you could add your state unemployment insurance and your uh, retirement contributions. Medical um, insurance. Right. So, but, but the calculation, you have, to start, you have to project it. So what we started doing is uh, creating Excel spreadsheets for everybody. So, yeah. right, what is, it, what is your average payroll every week or every pay period? And what is the actual, what is your projected and what is your actual? And so that you could kind of keep, uh, it's almost like a GPS, keep track as you go and then kind of decide at the end, you know, what needs to be done, you know, if you have to adjust along the way, your route. Correct. It's going to take a lot of strategizing and working with your, your accountant because you're going to have to um, adjust as the time goes on. Some are and easier the, than others. And to the extent it's not forgiven, it becomes a loan. Tell us about the details of the loan. Yeah, the loan, beca- it becomes, it conver- anything that's not forgiven converts into a two-year loan at 1%. It's deferred for six months. Um, so that's, you know, the, the payments will start six months after forgiveness and um, at 1% for two years. Right. So, Which is a very reasonable loan mm-hmm. for two years, yeah. All right. So quick question. So if you're using the money for payroll, then you still have to pay the payroll tax on that, right? Yes. Yeah. Right. So it's not – so that has to be calculated into it. So even if – so if yes, you're – Yes, if a person makes $10,000, you – the gross wages are ten thousand. You still have to take the payroll taxes out of the paycheck. Right now, is that deferred under the regular payroll rules, or or it's, it, it because it's money that's current? You have it. You have to pay that the payroll tax. Just just the point well, two percent of the employer's share can be deferred until or, it's forgiven. Until the PPP is forgiven, you could do a deferral until the PPP is forgiven. Given okay, right. All right, so so the bottom line on a lot of this is really that you really need to talk to a lot of professionals if you are not really. I can see there's a lot of landmines in this. Well, it's not. Yeah, you know, a lot of things are not clear, and the guidance keeps changing every, every day. There's new guidance, right? And, right. and they're not going to make it easy. Before. They're right. not going to make it easy for you. You're going to have to work to get it forgiven. It's it's potentially possible. It's just and, making and, sure and you to work with clarity and if. There's absolutely no clarity here whatsoever. I think the key is really to chat with your own bank where you got the funds from 
and decide, see if they have some kind of uh, Excel spreadsheet or, you know, what are they going to require? We've been telling everybody put the money in a separate bank account, uh, keep uh, very clear documentation so that when you go to uh, ask for forgiveness at the end, it's all right there. Um, but I think you should, you know, just have a discussion with your bank up front so you know what it is that they're going to look for, so that there should be no surprises at the end. Right. We, we've advised clients to put into a, to a separate account and transfer money from that separate account, for argument's sake, into the payroll account if they're working with a payroll service. The payroll services supposedly are giving out Excel sheets or will provide us with the documentation for, for wages. Um, but it's the problem is with rent and utilities equaling the other other 25%. That seems to be more of the issue because we don't even know. We haven't gotten a clear definition of what a utility is. Also, it has to be, quote, incurred and paid during that eight-week period. So that's a, approximately two months of rent, two months of everything. But we don't know what the everything is. Right. It's, it's gas, water, electric. It says transportation, but I haven't seen a definition of what transportation that, means. Don't, don't know what that means. Does it include cable TV in an office? You know, the easy part is you have telephone, internet, and utility, and gas, and electric. Right. That's easy stuff. We've been asked uh, if it includes sewer. We've asked if it includes um, waste management. So I'll tell, you, I'll tell you what I've been asked. Now, everyone's working from home. So those are your office expenses. Does it include your home expenses? The, the answer to that is no. Why? Because um, it had to have been in use prior to February 15th. Am I right, Lex? Yes, that's correct. All these leases and everything else have to have been in effect by February 15th. Ah, see, that's, see, that's important. It, that was a good question to ask because I've been getting questions about that and uh, I said you have to ask your CPAs because I have no idea. Just real fast. The, the now, co- understand the, wait, wait, hold, our disclaimer sec, is this is accurate as of, as of today. May 6, 2020, when we're May recording very this. well. There will be changes because even the IRS and the SBA has said that they will give definitions of forgiveness at a future date. Real fast, the, the CLE code for the Nassau County Bar Association, if, big if, uh, if this is uh, approved, will be KJT5620. Okay, so we only have about a minute and a half left. Um, any concluding thoughts, warnings, uh, words yes. of encouragement? Sure. Yes, I think, you know, let's be practical and realistic. There's going to be a lot of financial hardships even after July 15, 2020. And many individuals and businesses are going to need some kind of collection resolution. And you could certainly try to do it yourself. As I mentioned, the IRS and New York State both have things online that they could do on their, you could do on your own. Um, you could always contact us for help. As I mentioned, our phone number is 631-465-5000, Tenenbaum Law, litaxattorney.com. You could download our app. It's called Tax Helpline. It's free. Everything is free. And we have amazing, valuable links to both the IRS and New York State websites. And we'll give you a free 15-minute consultation. As I said, we're here to help, and we're here to be a resource to the community. All right. And then, Elliot, and, uh, and, if and you um, email us at info at KVLSM CPA, we've been putting out to our clients any changes that happens with any of the uh, COVID-related tax issues. All right. I cannot thank you enough for being the professionals that you are day to day um, and all the people that you've helped and the lifeline that you give to professionals like myself who really need the extra insight and experience. So thank you all for that. Thank you for volunteering your time today. And uh, hopefully this will be uh, continued in a future episode where we'll do a follow up. Until next time, Richard Solomon. I want to thank Karen. Elliot and Lexi, see you next week.